Hi all. Hi. Thank you very much for joining me this evening and thank you very much to the Architecture Foundation for having me and Alicia Prevaro for inviting me to be part of the Bedtime Story series. Um, my name is Nana Biamrafosu. I'm an architectural assistant here in London. I'm also a writer, part of the um, second cohort of the New Architecture Collective. And I'm also a researcher working um, collaboratively with, um, with Bushra Mohammed on a project called the Co Course of Empire, um, research in the compound house. And I also teach um, Studio 2.2 at Kingston's Department of Architecture and Landscape. Um, this evening, I'll be reading to you from Sam Selvin's The Lonely Londoners, um, which is a book written in 1956. But I feel um, the reason I've chosen this book is because it talks about the city and it talks about London as a city, but also most, most importantly, the immigrant experience of a city. And I think given the current climate um, with COVID-19 and also with the current um, racial tensions in our city that we see. It's an important time to reflect on how, how the city as an urban fabric and as a piece of kind of construct actually works to either engage or restrict or even sometimes um, suffocate uh, people, of, people of different origins in the city and how much we take the rights of access and freedom within our built environment um, as, as a given, and that it's actually not a given for everyone. Um, I was first introduced to this book by my sister, who's also a writer, Shawa Anna, um, and, as, um, she, and she said to me that if I'm interested in talking about architecture and the city and about kind of an immigrant's experience, and this book is a must, and um, she wasn't wrong. Um, I think Selvin captures the city in a really interesting way where he talks about its impermeable form to newly arrived immigrants and also how different cultures adapt to the city and often there is somebody that acts as a kind of cultural translator to new people coming into, into a city and we find that in London all over. Um, in the first semester of teaching this um, this year, Studio 2.2, we asked our students to design a house for multi-generational living. And lots of our students, um, most of, some of them immigrants themselves or second generation immigrants, chose to design a home for their families or their extended families. And I thought that was a really rich reflection on actually what the, the urban fabric we're given as immigrants is and how we then adapt our, our lives or daily rituals and cultures to, to that. Um, so I think what, what this book has taught me a lot is um, reflecting on Abu Malik's um, Simone's essay, People as Infrastructure, is that, um, you know, actually beyond the city, it's actually the people in it, especially for, from an immigrant point of view, that um, provide the infrastructure and the ways of navigating um, through the city. Uh, so I hope you enjoy tonight's read. Um, it's written in uh, dialect, so I will apologise now if I mess up ever so slightly, but I'll do my best to do it justice. So yeah, thank you for joining me and I'll get started now. One grim winter evening, when it had the kind of unrealness about London, with a fog sleeping restlessly over the city and the lights showing in the blur as if not London, but some strange place on another planet, Moses A. Toller hopped on the number 46 bus on the corner of Chepstow Road and Westbourne Grove to go to Waterloo to meet a fella who was coming from Trinidad on the boat train. Moses sit down and pay his fare and take out a white handkerchief and blow his nose. The handkerchief turned black and Moses watch it and curse the fog. He wasn't in a good mood and the fog wasn't doing anything to help the situation. He had to get up from a nice warm bed, dress and come out in this nasty weather to go and meet a fella that he didn't even know. That was the hurtful part. It wasn't like the fellow was his brother or cousin or even friend. He didn't know the man from Adam. But he got a letter from a friend in Trinidad who said that a fellow is coming by the SS Hillebrand and if he would please meet him at Waterloo Station in London and help him until he gets settled. The fellow named Henry Oliver, but a friend tell Moses not to worry because he described Moses to Henry and all he had to do is be in the station when the boat train pull in and this fella Henry would find him. So for old time's sake, Moses find himself 
Moses find himself on a bus going to Waterloo, vexed with himself that his heart's so soft that he's always doing something for somebody and nobody ever doing a thing for him. Because it took Moses that because it took because it looked to Moses that he hardly have t- time to settle into Old Britain before all sorts of fellas start coming straight up to his room in the water when they land up in London from the West Indies, saying that so-and-so tell him that Moses is a good fellow to contact, that he would help them to get a place and work to do. Jesus Christ, Moses tell Harris, a friendly ad. I never see a thing so. I don't even know these people at all, yet they come to me as if I'm a liaison officer and I catch my ass. How could this, how could I have possibly help them out? And this was a sort of, and this was, this was happening at a time when English people were starting to make a rab about how many, how much to, how, how too much West Indians come into the country. This, this was a time when any corner you turn, 10 to 1, you bound, you bound to bounce up a spade. In fact, the boys all over London and have, and have a place where you couldn't find them and a big discussion going on in Parliament about the situation. Though the old Britain too diplomatic to clamp down the boys or do anything drastic like stop them from coming to the mother country. But the big headlines in the papers every day and whatever the papers and news, and whatever the newspapers and the radio say in this country, that the people Bible. Like one time when the newspapers say that West Indians think that the streets of London paved with, with gold, a Jamaican fella went into income tax office to find out something and the first thing the clerk says to him is you people think the streets of london are paved with gold newspapers and radio rule this country now the position moses have uneasy because to tell the truth most of the fellows who come in now are real hustlers desperate it's not like it's not like long time when 40 or 50 straggling in they are come they invaded the country by the hundreds and when them fellows who are here a long time see people running from the West Indies, it's only logic for them to say it would be damn foolishness to go back. So, so, what, Mos- so what Moses could do when these fellows land up hopeless on a doorstep with one set of luggage, no place to sleep and nowhere to go? One day a set of fella come. Who tell, who tell you my name and my address, Moses asked them. Oh, we got it from a fella named Jackson who's, who was up here last year. Jackson a bitch, Moses say. He know I'm seeing hell myself. We have money, the fellas say. We, we only want you to help us to get a place to stay and tell us how to get work. That harder than money, Moses grunts. I don't, I, I don't know why the hell you come to me. But all the same, he went out with them because he used to remember how desperate he was when he, when he first came to London and didn't know anybody or anything. Moses sent the boys to different address to different addresses. Too, me- too much spades in the water now, he, t- he tell him. Try down by Clapham. You don't know how to get... Apologies, I think it just cut out there, so I'll carry on. I'll pick up where I left off. Moses sent the boys to different addresses. Too many spades in the water now, he tell him. Try down by Clapham. You don't know how to get there? They'll tell you the chief station. Also, the three of you, go to King's Cross Station and ask for a fella named Samson who work in the, in the luggage department, he'll help you out. And so, like a welfare officer, Moses scattering the boys around London, for he did not want no condensed area in the water. As it is, things are bad enough already. One or two that he'd take a fancy to, he'd take him round by the houses that he knew would be all right to go to. For at this stage, Moses knew which parts they would slam the door in your face and which parts they would take in spades. And it's the soft hearts that have him here now on the bus going to Waterloo to meet a fella named Henry Oliver. He didn't know what he, what, how, how he was always getting into positions like this, helping people out. He sighed, the damn bus creak, crawling in the fog and in the, evening so me- and the evening so melancholy that he wished he would go back to bed. When he gets to Waterloo, he hop off and went into the station. And right away in the big station, he had a feeling of homesickness he never felt in nine, ten years in he is in this country. For the old Waterloo is a place of arrival and departure. A place where you see people crying goodbye or kissing welcome. And he hardly have a time to sit down on the bench before this feeling of nostalgia hit him and he was surprised. It have, it have some fellas who in Britain a long time and yet they can't get away from the habit of going to Waterloo whenever a boat train coming in with passengers from the West Indies. 
They like to see the familiar faces. They like to watch their countrymen coming off the train. And sometimes they might spot somebody they know. Hey, Watson, what the hell are you doing in Britain, boy? Why didn't you write to me tell me you was coming? And they would start, they, and they will start big old talk with travellers, finding out what is happening in, in Trinidad, in Grenada, in Barbados, in, the, in Jamaica and Antigua. What's the latest Calypso number, if anybody dead? And like that, and, and so on and so on. Even asking strangers questions they can't answer. Like, do you know Tanti, ba uh, Tanti Simmons, who lives in La Boise in Port of Spain, or a fellow named Harrison working in the Red House? But Moses, he never got into that sort of slackness. The thought never occurred to him to go to Waterloo just to, just to see who's coming up from the West Indies. Still, the station is a sort of place where you have a soft feeling. It was here that Moses did land when he come to London, and he have no doubt that when the time come, if it ever come, that it will be where he'd say goodbye to the big city. Perhaps he was thinking it was time to go back to the tropics, and that's why he was sort of he he and that's why he sort of lonely and miserable. Moses was sitting on the bench, smoking the woods, when a Jamaican friend named Toro come up. The boat train come in yet? Toro ask, though he know it ain't come in yet. No, Moses say, though he know Toro no. Boy, I'm expecting my mother to come, in a nervous way, as if frightened at the idea. You send for her, Moses say? Yes, Toro say. Ah, I wish I could, I could, I wish I was like all you Jamaican, Moses say. All of you could live on two, three pounds a week and save up money in a, in a suitcase under the bed. And when you have enough, you send them for the family. I can't even save a cent of my pay. What I do is my business, Toro say, taking offence. Yes, I mean, I ain't say it's a bad thing. I was trying to do the same thing ever since I came to this country. I was just thinking about when you yourself first did come, how I help you to get a job in the factory and how I help you and how now you have so much money and I can't, I don't even have a cent. So we go, boy. You still live in a Harrow Road? Yes. But now that the old lady coming, I will have to find a bigger place. You know about any? No, not my way. But big city telling me yesterday it have a house down by the grove which have some vacant rooms. Why don't you see him and find out? I'll see him tomorrow. You have a cigarette? I was just smoking the last. Toro sit down on the bench with Moses and the two of them watching Waterloo Station and all the things that are happening and all the people that are coming and going. Where the guitar? Moses asks. I didn't bring it, man, Toro say. When Toro, first, when Toro did first left Jamaica, he bring with him a guitar to Britain. And he always had the guitar with him, playing in the road and in the tube and when he was standing up in the queues. We better get a platform ticket, Moses say. And, just, and, and they were just in time for the boat train pull in and people start to come off the train. Moses stand up out of the way with his hands in his pockets, not interested in the passengers, only waiting for the fella Henry to come off so he could go home, he could get back home and out of the cold and fog. It was, it, it had a Jamaican fella who lived in Brixton that had, come to the, that had come to the station to see what tenants he could pick up for the houses he had in Brixton. This test, when he first, first come, when he first come, come up, open up a club, and by and by, he save money and buy a house. The next thing you know, he buy a whole, a whole street of houses in Brixton and let out rooms to the boys, hitting them for anything like three or four guineas for a double. When it comes to making money, it ain't nothing like ease me up or we're both countrymen together in old London. Sometimes he put a bed and a chair in two or three big rooms and tell the fellas they could live in there together, but each would have to pay a pound. So you can imagine, five, six fellas in one room and test coin and money for so. When a boat train come in, he hustling down to Waterloo to pick up, to pick up them fellas who new to London and ain't have nowhere to stay, telling them Brixton's a nice area, that they have plenty of Jamaicans down there already and they will fill at home in the district because the may on the boys' side and ain't have much prejudice there. While Moses smiling to see Tess hustling tenants, a newspaper fella come up behind, come up to him and say, "Excuse me, sir, have you just arrived from Jamaica?" And Moses don't know why the hell, why, but he say he tell the fella, "Yes." Would you tell me what the condition? Would you tell? Would you like to tell me what the conditions are like there? The fella take out a notebook and a pencil and look at Moses. Now Moses don't know the first thing about Jamaica. Moses came from Trinidad. 
which is a thousand miles from Jamaica. But the English people believe that everybody who comes from the West Indies come from Jamaica. The situation is desperate, Moses say, thinking fast. You know the big hurricane that happened two weeks ago? Yes, the reporters say, for in truth, it did have a hurricane in Jamaica. Well, I was in that hurricane, Moses say. Plenty of people get killed. I was sitting down in my house and suddenly when I look up at the sky, what do you think happened? What? The hurricane blow the roof off. But tell me, sir, why so many Jamaicans immigrate into England? Ah, Moses say, that is a question to limit. That is what everybody tried to work, find out. They can't get work, Moses say, warming up. And furthermore, let me give you my view on the situation in this country. We can't get a place, no place to live, and we only getting the worst jobs they have. But by that time, the infant, tell, the infant feel like he catch up with Moses and say thank you and hurry off. Moses was sorry. It was the first time he ever really got a chance to say his mind, and he had a lot of things to say. Though one time they wanted to take his photo, it happened while he was working at the railway yard and all the people in the place say they, they go on strike unless the boss fire Moses. It was a big ballad in all the papers. They put it under a big headline saying the colour bar was causing trouble again. And the fella come with a camera and wanted to take Moses' photo, but Moses say no. A few days later, the boss called Moses and tell him he's sorry. But as they were cutting down stuff and he was new, he would have to go. Meanwhile, Toy rode down by the bottom of the train, stumbling over suitcase and baggage as he's trying to see everybody, everybody get it, coming off the train at the same time. An old woman who looked like she were dead any time come out of the, of the carriage, carrying a cardboard box and a paper bag. When she can't get out of the train and stand up there on the platform as if she confused. Then after, then after a young girl ca come carrying a flower bag filled with things. Then a young man wearing a wide brim hat and a jacket falling below the knees. And then a little boy and a little girl. And then another old, another old woman tottering so much that God had to help her get out of the train. Oh, Jesus Christ, Toro say. What is all this? Toro, the first mother says. You don't know your own mother? Toro hug his mother like a man in the days and say, But what is Tante Betsy doing here, Ma? And Agnes and Lewis and the two children. All of we come to our own Marseille. This is how it happened. When you write home and say you were getting five pounds a week, to Lewis say, oh God, I'm going to England tomorrow. Well, Agnes say to she's not staying at home alone with the children. So we all, all of us will come. What about Tanti? Well, you know how old your Tanti getting, Toro. It's a shame to leave her alone dead in Kingston with no one to look after her. Oh God, Ma, why, why bring all these people with you? Toro starts to shiver with a kind of fright. Ah, you see, ah, what, you see why I tell you, Tansy say to the mother. You see how ungrateful he is? I will go back to Jamaica right now. And she makes as if she's go going back onto the train. Toro, mum say, mum, ma say, you remember when you were a little boy and how you used to live with a Tansy and she used to mind you and send you to school and give you tea and bake in the evening. Remember th them days? When Tanti gave you shoes and to wear and pants to put on your backside. How, how are you expecting me to leave Tanti behind when the whole family come into England? But ma, you don't know what you put yourself in. Look, Toro starts to argue right there on the platform and people watching them. A porter pushing a trolley say, come, come on there, out of the way. And he bounce up Tanti, who looking, at, who looking all around the station with her eyes wide open. Look at trouble here, Tansy say. Mister, you best says what, mind what you're doing, yes? If you touch me again, I will call the police for you. Toro pull all the family out of the way and stand there arguing, for Toro ain't catch himself yet and he can't even realise how all these people are on his hands in London in the grim of winter and no place to go and stay. Sorry. The, re the reporter fella see a small crowd and he figured that it looked like a family and he might get a good story from them as to why so much Jamaican come into London. So he went up to Tansy and say, excuse me, lady, I'm from the Echo. Is this your first trip to England? Don't tell that man anything, Toro growl. Why are you so prejudiced, Tansy say? The gentleman asked a good question and why shouldn't I answer? And she turns to the reporter and say, 
Yes, mister, it's my first trip. Have you any relatives here? How are you going, are you going to live in London? Well, my nephew Toy Roy in the country a long time, so he sent for the rest of the family to come and live with him. Not so, Toy Roy? But Toy Roy had gone to help Lewis and Agnes with their, with their fi find their luggage. Toy Roy a good boy, Tansy say. I mind him since he was small. Yes, the reporter says. But can I ask you, why are so many people leaving Jamaica and coming to England? It's the same thing I say, Tansy say, excited. I tell them all who's coming. Why are you all leaving the country to go to England? Over there, it's so cold that only white people does live there. But they say that they have more work in England and better pay. And to tell you the truth, when I hear Toro getting five pounds a week, I have to agree. Tell me, madam, what will you do in England? What will you do in London? Who? Me? Tansy asks, looking around as if the reporter's talking to somebody else. Why? I come to look after the family. All of them was coming, so I had to come too, to look after them. Who will cook and wash the clothes and clean the house? This time, this time so, Matt pulling Tansy's hand to make, sure, to make her stop talking, but Tansy only shaking off the hand. What happened to you, Tansy tell Ma? You can't see this gentleman from the newspapers come to, come to meet we by the station. We have to show that we have good manners, you know. May I take your photo, the reporter asked. He wants to take our photo, Tansy nudged Ma. Where are the children? Toy Roy, Agnes, Lewis. She calling it out as if she's in the backyard in Jamaica. All of you come, come and take a photo, children. The mister wants a snapshot. One of you will be quite sufficient, the reporter say. What, Tansy say, you can't take me alone. You have to take the whole family. And then she went off to round up the rest. Now, Toy Roy don't want to... Now, Toro don't want no part in this business, but Tanti insisting so much that to not make a bigger scene, people standing up there watching them, he went and stood by Ma with a sulky face. Wait a minute, Tanti say, telling the, Tanti tell the reporter when he was ready. And she began to open, open up the cardboard box right there on the platform, and she take out a straw hat with a wide brim and put it on her head. I'm ready now, she say, posing with the family. I hope you don't find our weather too cold for you, the reporter said maliciously when he was going away. The next day, when the echo appeared, it had a, it had a picture, and under the picture, right, now, Jamaican families come to Britain. While all this confusion happening, Moses was killing himself with laugh, but as all the people begin to go away, he can't see Henry Oliver, at least nobody ain't broach him. And so he was just making up his mind to go home when he spotted Tess straggling from the bottom of the train as if he did fall asleep and, no, and didn't know when the train reached Waterloo. And the truth is, and, and in truth, this is what happened to Henry. And though he tells some fellas in the, in the carriage to wake him up when he gets to London, in the hustlement of getting off the train, nobody remember Henry and a guard, and a guard had to wake him up. Moses watched Henry coming off the of the platform and have a feeling that it couldn't be the fella he'd come to meet. For this test, for this test, have on only an old grey tropical suit and a pair of watch con and no overcoat or muffler or gloves or anything for the cold. So Mays is sure that it's some test who's living in London a long, long time accustomed to this beast winter. Even so, he, re he really had to feel f for the fella. For the evening advancing, it's getting colder and colder, and Moses stamping his feet as he get up, he, as he get up, he stand up there. The fella, as soon as he see Moses, walk straight up to him and say, "Ah, I bet you're Moses." Moses say, "Yes." Ah, Henry say, looking at looking about the desolate station as if he's in an exhibition hall on a pleasant summer evening. Frank say that you you would come to meet me in Waterloo. My name is Henry Oliver. You're not feeling cold, old man, Moses say, eyeing the specimen with amazement, for he himself have on a long wool coat and a uh, long wool underwear and a heavy fireman coat that he pick up in Portobello Road. No, Henry say, looking surprised. This is this is the way the weather does be in the winter. It's not so bad, man. In fact, I'm feeling a little warm. Jesus Christ, Moses say, what happened to you? You sick or something? Who? Me? Sick? Ha ha, you're making joke. Moses watched the specimen suspiciously again. You must have bags of wool under your suit. You can't fool an old test like me. What are you making so much fuss about, Henry say, opening his shirt to show his bare skin underneath. This is nice climate, boy. You feeling cold? 
Take it easy, Moses say, deciding, deciding to wait and see how things will develop with this strange character. Get your luggage and we'll go. Tonight you can stay with me, but tomorrow I might shift from my room and go upstairs and I'll see if I could fix you up with the landlord to take over my room. Whenever you're ready, Henry say. Where's your luggage? What luggage? I ain't have any. I figure it's no sense and load up myself with, with a set of things when with a set of things when i start work i will buy some things now mace is a veteran who's been living in this country a long time and he's met he's meets all sorts of people and do all sorts of things but he never thought the day would come when he'd meet a fellow who would land from the sunny tropics on a win on a powerful winter morn winter evening with a tropical suit saying that he had no lag luggage you mean to tell me you you mean you come from trinidad with nothing well, the old toothbrush is in the pockets, Henry patted, Henry pats the jacket pocket, and I have on a pair of pyjamas. Don't worry, I'll fix up soon as, as soon as I start work. You do smoke? Yes. You have any on you? I finished my last pack on the train. You mean to say you come off the ship with no cigarettes? You don't know how, you, you don't know that they allow you to land with 200 and that fellas manage to come on with five, 600? You don't know how expensive cigarettes are in this country? Nobody tell you anything at all about London. Frank ain't give you some tips before you leave Trinidad? Oh, he say a lot of things, but you know how fellas always like to exaggerate, I only listen halfway. You just drink? Yes. You mean to say you come off the ship with no rum? You don't know how, you don't know they allow you to land with two bottles and that some of the boys manage to come ashore with five or six, with five or six, getting other people who can't who don't have any to bring them for them you don't know how much a bottle of rum does cost in london how much 37 and 6 how much is that in trinidadian money that's about 10 dollars henry whistles phew you you bring any money moses went on for by this time he wasn't even sure if this if this was a dream he was dreaming and would wake up and laugh at it i have three pounds henry says defensively but ease me up with the questions, old man. I'm tired after a long journey. It's five pounds you could it's five pounds all you could land with, you know? Yes, but I get into a wappy game on, on board with some fellas and lose two. Boy, it was a wappy game it was a wappy it was a wappy test on board. All right, Sir Galliad, Moses say, take it easy. London will do for you a long time. Come on, we'll catch the tube as you ain't have any luggage. Thus, Thus, it was how Henry Oliver Esquire, alias Sir Galihad, descend on London to swell the population by one, and eight and a half months later, it had Galihad Jr. Ladbroke Grove, and all them English people stopping on the road, admiring the baby curly hair, with a mother pushing the pram as she goes shopping for rations. So that's the conclusion of that book. So I've just read the first um, 12 pages of The Lonely Londoners and I can't recommend it enough. I think it's a brilliant um, work of literature by Sam Selvin and it, and it sits in a collection of books called The Longman Caribbean Writers. Um, this um, series was also published along the same time as the Africa's Writers series. Um, I They're a fantastic range of books written by um, African and Caribbean writers at a time of emer emergent independence for the global south, especially of black countries, and this situation of immigrating to the mother country. And I think in the, cl in the current climate condition we find ourselves in, in conversations about um, the Windrush generation, the, um, the policies of the home, home office, all these things really become pertinent um, to think about and to reflect on. And in terms of COVID especially, it's been really interesting to see the discussions about um, how um, black and ethnic minority communities have been affected by COVID. And reading this um, in, um, text this evening and previously before, before this, I was thinking a lot about how um, African countries have fared pretty well um, relatively well um, in response to COVID. And I was thinking about how these things are a lot to do with community and how people cut off from the community um, struggle to survive. And, and we've seen that in, our, in, in London where COVID has taken a toll on us particularly because the, that sense of community doesn't exist so much and how we've had to reinvent those um, senses of community and how important people become in the infrastructure 
for the city. So um, I hope you'll continue reading if you enjoyed um, the tests from it, um, the bits I've read from it. And thank you very much for joining. So I'm going to sign off now. Thank you. Bye all.